Uh, just, I'll just introduce Krista and Claire now. They've been associates for independent thinking for, for quite a while, uh, and, um, and, and independent thinking is all the richer for that. Krista, uh, uh, when she first came to us, um, was a classroom teacher as well as um, on the leadership team. MFL is her superpower. Her book, Independent Thinking on MFL, came out not that long ago and has uh, been really, really well received, is selling well, if you like. Um, but one of the things she does is it's more than just about the languages teaching. There's loads and loads. If you're languages teachers out there, get the book. But it's also about the environment, the physical and the emotional environment that you create for young people. So I'm great. I'm really pleased and grateful that she can come on this conversation. And then Claire Gadsby, who's been an associate even longer, I think, uh, uh, and has first came to us through her work around assessment and is still an assessment guru in all sorts of ways. And is also, and based around her, her last book, uh, is, has totally transformed the way teachers can look at their, their environment and the link between learning and their environment and well-being and just the emotional feel of the classroom. Does that describe you well enough, Claire and Krista? Are we, are we good to go with that? Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> right, Krista, what, how would you describe the environment that you created prior to all this COVID stuff, so when you were a classroom teacher teaching languages, how did you create an environment that made teaching work for you? Well, for me, obviously, being someone who valued their subject, loved, loved their subject and was slightly horrified that um, I can't remember how long ago it was into my teaching career where some students would come to my lessons and not love them like I did. I mean, who could even consider that? I mean, really? So I um, so for me, it was about um, looking at what students um, were coming from and I realised that every single student was was coming to my classroom and um, having done um, subjects in their mother tongue and now they were going to be in a French or German or Spanish classroom and they were quite anxious about that and actually everybody's brain needs to take a little bit of time to adjust to that you know to transition from your entire I don't know if you had a 25 hour school week or a 30 hour school week or if you had 10 lessons a day if only one of those out of the other eight or nine um, were all in your mother tongue you know that that one was in a foreign language you needed to do something to about about it and i know howell and nina and, and claire talk about sometimes and jonathan lear talk about protecting students in and getting them in so for me it was about creating having that emotional connection with them getting them to realize that they were coming to this amazing place and i remember um my very um my very first interview my very first school kind of saying i want students to come into a classroom where it takes them from the world that they're in and catapults them to a different place and that for me was my responsibility to do as a teacher to hook them in to entice them in so they were really excited about coming to this classroom that looked different sounded different and actually for the kids that i was teaching at the time whether it's in the forest of dean or you know here in the southwest um it might be their only opportunity to go to a seemingly foreign country and that was through through walking through my classroom door and just coming and experiencing that and having that human connection with them inviting them in and saying saying that this was a safe happy place with lots of bright colors lots of different smells and sounds good ones I should say um, in the classroom and just making sure that they felt happy safe and felt that they could learn something really amazing here wow so, so give, give us an example of how I, so if I walked into that classroom what would I how would I know that I was what what what, what was the catapult? The, what was the catapult? Um, well, coming through the door, obviously using um, often using music to to invite them in. To um, again, um, could be in French, Spanish, German, Russian. It could be anything, just to get them in to kind of think, oh, there's music. Where you know what are we doing today and get them to listen to the song or have a video playing or have some images playing, getting them to think about things. The walls. I mean, my classrooms have always been. And I have got into bother for this, actually, for not always asking permission from the uh, site team. You know, the floors, the walls around the board, the ceilings have always had displays, books, realia, um, magazines, things that the young people coming into my classroom could see and feel and touch and smell and kind of go, wow, what is this? And also, um, when when times was appropriate you know if i'd been on holiday been overseas could get something in bringing something in that they could experience for themselves or something they could see eat touch you know that that whole sensory way of learning and, and bringing them in that way wow so uh, multi-sensory and multi-dimensional yeah well, absolutely absolutely again wherever. it's that whole thing of taking them from from uh, bristol the forest of dean wherever 
to France, to Italy, to Spain, because I could, if I can't physically take them there, and I know Jim Robeson talked about getting kids on trips yesterday, you know, I'm doing that. If I can't take them there, I want to take them there during my lesson. I want them to see it and feel it. I can't, um, can't necessarily take them to a market in Marrakesh, but do you know what? I can give them an opportunity and play them the sounds. And I think I'll never forget the time when um, we found a three, um, 360 video of, um, of the Eiffel Tower. Some very low ability students were saying, oh, you know, what is it? What is it? Is it even real? I think it was about the time that Ratatouille, that, that Disney film, um, there are other films available, but you know, um, that, that come out and, and kids weren't sure of it. So I showed them it and their mind was blown. They couldn't believe it. And they felt they were there because we played some music. We had some, you know, in, in the background, they were just watching this in absolute awe. And I took them from where they were in that classroom to the Eiffel Tower and they were like, this is amazing, this is amazing. And that's what, that's what that connection is and taking them from somewhere, you know, from, the, from a normal school curriculum, a normal school day overseas to experience something that they might not at that point in time have ever thought they would ever be able to. Wow. We'll, we'll, I want to come back to you as well on how you, as the teacher, change the weather in the classroom, which I think is a phrase um, Vic Goddard used, you, know, you create the weather in the classroom and also your, your inspiration and work with um, the phrase you know, un unconditional positive regard that Vic and Dave Whittaker and Barnsley work with. So we'll, we'll come back to the impact that the teacher has, but let's stick with the environment, the catapulting of the environment. Claire, what, 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 uh, what, what catapulting have you witnessed or have you encouraged or have you done yourself in classrooms? Well, the great irony for me is, of, although I've spent the last sort of five years, I suppose, thinking really intensively about the environment, um, if I cast my mind back to the physical environment I had as an English teacher, um, certainly the early part of my career, it wasn't overly inspiring at all to begin with. But like Krista, I think what physically, but I think what I was always trying to do as a teacher was to create the feeling around the subject and a feeling around learning. So, um, I've always been very, very inspired by Mayor Angelou's famous quote that people will forget what you say, forget what you do, they'll never forget how you made them feel. So I, my first teaching job was in um, an ex-mining community in the East Midlands. Um, kids that would, you know, lie down and they'd, they'd give you everything once you'd got their, um, their respect and, and commanded that sort of relationship and, and, and a sense of belonging. And I think people ask me about my finest hour in the classroom and I go back to the year um, NQT plus one where my bottom set year nine boys group who were... Um, lively shall we say um persuaded me that they uh, that, 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 well I helped basically uh, that I'd helped them to fall in love with Shakespeare because it was the era of the um you know just read the extracts let's just do a little bit of this and they said you made us feel in your classroom like we could read the whole play and we did and we came back at lunch times and break times and we got the whole play read and it was kind of a pivotal moment for me when I realized that yes I am the architect of this learning landscape for these these kids and that sense of moral responsibility they're only going to get one go at year nine and it was in my hands to create that feel that that love of the subject that I was so passionate about so that was my sort of early, early experience as a teacher. And of course, what happened when I became a consultant, I still consider this to be the most privileged job in the world because I'm invited into hundreds of classrooms every year. And that is such an enormous privilege because if you look at what the, the research talks, they, they, they call, uh, talk about how the privatisation of, of, of classrooms, how intensely personal that is. And once you invite somebody else in, you're open to scrutiny and in an accountability culture that can be really threatening. So I've always wanted to get alongside teachers and coach them, work with them in the classroom. And what I was noticing in hundreds and hundreds of classrooms all over the world is this, this fantastic resource, your physical space and busy teachers weren't necessarily realising just this, this untapped potential that was there. And so we started to do, do small tweaks to existing displays. That's where we started. So the book that, that I wrote, Dynamic for Different Classrooms, um, huge privilege to write it with my, um, one of my very best friends and my ex-colleague, Janet Evans. And together we started to look at, well, what happens if we say to busy teachers well don't don't, don't rewrite don't redesign these displays they're great already but let's get the kids to look at them differently so one of the very simple simple tricks if you like is to simply cover something up a part of a word a part of an image let's put something under cover and we'll just um, challenge the children to see if they can remember what was what was there yesterday what's different and once you get children to step into this space and to start reading it and to look for the things that are different <gasps> there's a new word that wasn't there yesterday, something's moved. Um, we, we started to see them come alive. And there's a couple of photos in the book actually that still almost bring a tear to my eye because it's a look on the children's faces when they're that engaged with the physical learning experience. And, and that, was, um, that was kind of a, a really pivotal moment for me. So 
ever so easy to do, but wow, what a difference it makes when we do when we do sort of pull that in. So it, um, the Reggio Emilia approach describes uh, the environment as like the third teacher. It's another it's another person's worth of impact if we if we use it, and and that's what I've been increasingly excited to explore with teachers. And it works for any learners, any age, anywhere. It's it's very simple to do, and I think it's going to be really important in these coming these coming weeks and months. The third teacher is a, it's a great phrase. It's a, it's, a, it's a book out as well, and there's resources around the third teacher. So the, the, the first teacher is the teacher. The second teacher is the children teaching each other, I think. And then the third teacher is the actual, the physical environment. And both of you are using the physical environment to transform the first two teachers, if you like. And, and, and your book that you mentioned, uh, which Jane Hewitt, who uh, was on one of these set, uh, conversations with uh, Juliet Robertson, talked about outdoors learning recently, did the, pho pho the amazing photography for the book. The dynamically different, and it's the dynamic bit, it's the fact that your classroom is a dynamic thing, it's a changing thing, it's a, it's a, it, it, well, can you just explain the dynamism of a learning environment a little bit more, Claire? Yeah, I, I think so. I think it's that idea that, well, the, the statistic that, that started the project for me was realising that kids spend about 2,100 days or 10,500 hours trapped in a classroom. And the classrooms are very small and the kids get bigger. And we can't, uh, you know, we can't keep reinventing um, the classroom. Is it? We've got to get the kids to experience a finite classroom in an infinite number of different ways. So the dynamism is the fact that, as I said, we might have this display here on Monday, but look at it again and you'll notice something's different by Tuesday. We started to... to um, become really interested in that moment the threshold moment when students step into your into your classroom because that's where you put your your stamp on your your learning arena if you like and I, I think um you know it's fair to say we all operate in an accountability culture there's such a lot of anxiety and pressure on teachers wherever you're you're working um it's that idea that this is this is your kingdom this is the bit that you can put your stamp on so uh, one of the ideas in the book is about meeting children at the door and um getting them to step over something that's literally in in the threshold of the door it's a key word it's a stimulus it's something um of the spirit that, that krista was describing just something that intrigues and we plant that in their consciousness on the way in so it's not just a nice opportunity to meet and greet and say welcome and you're coming into my classroom but we put down a literal marker what does can you see that word could you say that word can you tell it to me on the way in uh, of course on the way out what we would do is we'd flip that word over and blank it all except the first letter can you tell me now from retreat can you recall that word can you remember it have you got a legacy of the lesson that's that's going with you so it, it, it's really about yeah sort of drawing busy busy teachers attention to the fact that it, it's all there anyway let's just kind of um, marginal gains we describe in the book one percent different in each of these areas you've suddenly got a very different feel in these classrooms for these young people wow often what i see going into classrooms is is good work up on the wall so the finished product is up on the wall to what extent can can bad work up on the wall or the process of going from bad work to good work or the or the or the, the, the learning how can we replicate uh, represent that learning process on the wall so that we can see learning in action I think that's a really brilliant question and, and it really bothered me because if your work is selected and you've got the celebrity you know you've got that fated piece of work that's sitting up there and you feel great about it but somebody else's isn't chosen I think we've got to think really carefully about the the damage that can be done so we need to celebrate all of, of all of everybody's work and your best bits but um, I think what's missing in a lot of those displays is the metacognitive sort of discourse around it so there's my best piece of work but there's a there's a sticky note next to it describing what I'm proud of in that work that I did so I know this is my best because can you see I've used a front and I've verbial for example or I've used it that we, we hear the voice of the child and of course once you've done that you can then say well uh, why don't you go and give some commentary to somebody else's work so take a sticky note and you're going to go and say what it was you appreciated in that wow work because children forget it, it just becomes beautiful wallpaper and that was a working title for the book for, for a while if it's just wallpaper if it's just pretty get yourself some nice wallpaper so let's go back to that work can we recall what the success criteria were can we annotate them can we have maybe some nice big funky coloured arrows that sit around the beautiful work but they have in big bold letters the, the reiteration of what the success criteria this work is great because and this is my first draft and can you see the difference in the second draft I remembered my subordinate clauses or whatever we're, we're, we're thinking about and I think that's really important because children can't remember why <laughs> why that work was on the wall but we can go back and have a, a memory challenge a little bit later and it suddenly reactivates that existing display it gives it a different set of credibility 
Well, I agree, okay. actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for that, I mean, way back when, and maybe, you know, this, this may be the point of contention, but when those levels were, were in place, we all had to have those things in corridors, in classrooms, of showing kids how to advance from one to the other with a model. And I don't see why they've disappeared. And I know some schools have got rid of displays in classrooms and don't show, want to show kids' best work, work, except for, like, you know, the front offices and the very front of school, which is, I think is an absolute tragedy because, yes, we want the kids to um to own the classrooms to own their space to be proud and actually when it is open day to not just have you know the the most perfect work we need to show the process of learning and actually use those walls those ceilings those floors that space around the board the corridors you know the backs of doors the front of doors the inside of cupboards what, whatever you know open those spaces up and use those as a tool for learning claire said you know the third teacher she's absolutely right and if we're not doing that then actually are we using our classrooms to best support our kids once they're in there you know to activate them as learners to remind them of what's expected you know to, for them to go up and say I really like this I'd like to be able to replicate it because it you know somebody's shown them what they could do or what they might be able to do and it's that expectation every single child in that classroom can achieve whatever stage you know that highest completed most wonderful piece if we show them and guide them how so your walls are a scaffold to enable them to do that and actually, they don't just have to sit there and be told by the teacher, by Claire or I, or any of the people sat with us today. They can do that for themselves by looking at the walls, looking at the corridors, and using it as a resource without yeah. being told. So, I could just jump in. Can I jump in just briefly? Sorry, Ian. One of my favourite case studies in the book actually was um, a lovely school um, in Lowestoft. And what they have in their dining hall, I think, is really powerful. So the place where the children all come together at least once a day and possibly, I think, for assemblies as well. So they're in this, this shared space. Um, uh, on the second week in September, they sit all the kids down first thing in the morning. The kids um, all do art and they all paint a bird. And I think nursery painter Robin and an eagle is painted. They have a different year group, has a different bird. Um, and then they, they all go on display in, in the hall. So you see this literal journey from that's what your birds might look like in, in nursery and look at the kind of birds you're going to be drawing, painting by the time you get to year six and they've got an equivalent for, for writing. So we're just saying to children all the time, subliminally, if you like, um, you are on a journey and you're here and that's great. And But look where you're going. And they've got a really, I think they've got a lovely inspirational quote, something like you um, you already have your wings, you just need to spread them and fly. Um, and I think it was birds that year, they did still life the next year. But every sort of space within the classroom, within the the school not just the classrooms is, is begging for that kind of um personalization if you like for teachers to take hold of it and and to really maximize the, the potential well thank you what's your view on I, I keep picking up um issues where there's a, a corporate element now in certain big academy chains and mats where your displays have to look like this and and if they're not they get taken down and, and made more corporate What's your experience or what, what advice would you give if anybody was in that sort of environment, uh, uh, Claire? Um, yeah, I've been into those, those those very environments, and they are they're beautiful. Those displays, and there's, there's nothing wrong with them per se. The question is, however it looks, are you using it? That's my, my my first question. Is that an active commodity in your classroom? Because maybe it has to be Hessian backed and black and white, and wh however you're told to do it. But if it's just sitting there and not earning its keep, then then we need to to activate that in some way. So you work with what you've got, and and if you have a corporate style, then that that's the starting point. But there's nothing to say that even on the most beautiful standardised display you can't cover a word um, add an extra word what I call a red herring challenge there's I've never seen a policy that legislates for what you can have in the threshold to your doorway what you're putting on the floor so I think it's about working working smart and and yeah and getting excited about the bits that you can change no I'm not saying break the rules but that is still your classroom and it's your moral responsibility to to make it as effective as you can for these learners in your in your care so yeah it, it, it just yeah that's the starting point it's it's what you do with this stuff afterwards really Okay. Can you, can you uh, and in a minute I'm going to come to Krista and talk about dressing up, dressing up <laughs> in, in secondary school, but just another question for Claire, sometimes I go into especially primary classrooms and there is so much going on, yeah. every space is full of everything and sometimes I just think I just want, a, I, I, I just want a bit of calm, I want a peace and, bit of yeah. peace and quiet and I know from you know the work that I've done around design that less, less is more and sometimes having nothing apart from one thing is more impactful than having loads of everything all of the time so what's your view on on on, on is, is there ever too much that we can be putting out there in the environment 
Yeah, I think absolutely. There's a balance to be struck. And certainly when we were writing the book, we looked very closely at Nathan's um, advice around particularly supporting children with special educational needs, because there's a real danger that we can overstimulate to the point of, of, of damage and distraction for some for some learners. So certainly whenever I go in and train train teachers, we'll do a little bit of talking together and then I'll say, right, let's let's do five minutes, you know, dash off to your classroom and change one thing. And invariably what they'll do is they'll come and tell me what they've taken out of the space because my, my first rule, you know, funny enough, I've been decluttering wardrobes during lockdown down and run out of things to do um, I think it's that same principle if you've not used it worn it you're not it, it's not been useful to you in the last x many weeks or months does that thing deserve its place in your classroom so certainly clearing the white space around the displays is really important if you're putting something away we might reintroduce it later but yes yeah, certainly trying to foreground and signpost the most important things and and I've been very very influenced by what's called the Pareto principle, the 80-20 idea that actually in any curriculum, people know about this, it's the, the golden 20%, if you like, that brings progress in the other 80%. So what I'm saying to teachers when I come into the classrooms is, okay, so let's have a look at the stuff that makes it onto the walls. Have you chosen something that's just pretty and aesthetically charming? Or is it something that speaks to that 20% that will really drive progress forward for year three? Oh, well, actually, I'm not sure, Claire. And if I take a maths board as a classic example, there's every type of maths jargon, everything's up there. But maybe what we want to be showing them at this point in the year is just one massive flip chart sized example of exactly how to do column addition with annotations and stay something that every child can see from whichever space they're sitting that's the other thing most of the things on the wall actually are so teeny tiny you can't read it unless you're standing on top of it with a, a microscope but it's it's got to be magnified that message i think so less is more bigger fonts and let's start thinking as well about the prime advertising space in your classroom it fascinates me kids are mainly you know they, they spend most of the day looking in one direction typically where the teacher is the beautiful stuff often the, the interesting stuff is behind them the teacher gets that that view but what's sitting around your whiteboard at the moment what's your headline message and how big is it and um, so i think there's absolutely work to do to declutter first and then think about what we're going to amplify lovely i, I remember um somebody sending me a book to look at a while back called declutter your classroom i think and that was especially with a special needs angle i think i think that book was um thank you krista so uh, part of the environment we talked about walls and ceilings and thresholds and things but part of what creates a classroom environment are the things in it as well that aren't humans um so tell us about dressing up boxes in secondary schools oh yeah we'll do can i just say to um following on your question to claire i think um i don't know how many people have ever sat in their classroom and if they teach um early years to sit on the floor and look to see what the kids see what the kids experience and actually when we're creating lessons we don't you know none of us i think sat here today will sit there and go i'm playing this lesson i'm doing this because this needs to be done you kind of think about your learner you not kind of you do think about your learners and and decide on their learning journey and plan accordingly same i've always found that works really well with displays as well so sit on the floor see it from their perspective what do you want them to learn from it how do you want it how do you want um it to help them and i know there was a wonderful teacher in my in in the school I left who in DT create these help boards and I know they're very big and it just was amazing for her learners um, and it was just great it just was spread across school like wildfires a number of years ago but for her learners it was just perfect because she thought what do my kids really need right okay this is what they need instead of going miss 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 and then she just did it and it just was amazing and so then for her learners that was a massive massive independence um, Thing that they could just get up and walk to the other side of the room get what they needed and then come back now obviously when schools go back next week and the week after uh, secondary that may not be the case we might have to manage that a little bit better obviously moving around the classroom but there we go um it's just thinking about what you want them to learn from it and why you're doing it again as, as claire said not just to make it look pretty for open even it's it's beyond that you know it is the third teacher so use it and, and and see it as that but look at it from the kids perspective as well can they access it can they see it or is it actually too high for them Hmm. no small things but there we go so dressing up oh yeah dressing up oh well modern foreign languages is my subject and subject that i love um but students don't really don't like to speak it and funny enough when they go to um overseas when we can it, well when we could in the past and when we can um they have to speak like we are speaking now not with a um it's all written down on a piece of paper and for me um getting learners to speak and I had a lot of discussions with our with our amazing um ninja who always moves in mysterious ways because i was saying 
I need some help. I'm getting these students, but I'm not getting all of them. And um, I didn't have a huge amount of learners with special educational needs, but I was like, tell me, tell me some of the strategies that you've used and that, and, and that you share with colleagues, because I need to employ something different because what I'm doing is not working. And we had, um, and we were talking, we were doing lots of drama. And um, one of the things that we were doing were, um, were had a sort of coloured wigs and things like that. But, but Nina said bring in some additional props. So we had big inflated microphones and, and various things like that. And we had a dress up box and the dress up box um, just came from, I don't particularly like fancy dress, I have to be honest, um, mm. but you know what? this was incredible and this was something that happened that I'd forgotten about and then came back into the classroom and I thought yes and it's an absolute winner um having a box there and I wanted students to do some speaking activities um you know hands would go up their school shirts they'd become very anxious their body language they would stutter they would do anything that they could to not do it even when Nina suggested giving them a digital device to help them record it um that some of them still struggled I didn't have have all of them and I wanted all of them to have the same expectations for all of them that I wanted them to speak and I wanted them to speak well and with confidence and and looking at oracy and really developing that because I believe that if they can speak it then they can you know if they can read it they can hear it they can speak it they can definitely write it and and communication essentially in a foreign language often and what I wanted them to be able to do is to go over to France Italy Germany Spain um, Russia and speak not just write because it's not about that they can do that afterwards if they want you know if they want to um, and it was a case of sombreros and um, uh, Venetian masks and coloured wigs and um, you know um, furry beards mustache handlebar mustaches anything you can get from a joke shop from a pound shop from that aisle in the supermarket doesn't have to cost a fortune but just something that the kids would come in and kind of go, oh, we're doing speaking today. And they wouldn't get anxious about it. They'd be like, miss, 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 how many items can we have? And I'd be like, what do you mean? It's like, well, you know, how many things? Because they wanted to dress themselves from head to toe. And um, there, were some there was one student in, in particular, a lovely, lovely young lady who was, um, I think the term, I hate this term, it's a terrible term, selective mute, that's what you know, she was referred to, um, to as. And um, she didn't have um, an EHCP or anything like that, but that's what was termed. And in some subjects, mine, she, she would speak and she would engage and she'd work in group work. Um, and in others, she just, she just wouldn't. She just wouldn't say perhaps, I don't know, a geography lesson. She just didn't want to speak. She wouldn't speak. She wouldn't even say, you know, respond when her name was called for the register. But in mine, she would. She was a proper little chatterbox, not all the time when she wanted to. And for her, she knew that when she spoke, she could put on um, like her hair, um, you know, like your grandma used to have, you tie it over and tie it under your chin. Um, this and some um, funky glasses, a bit like Dame Edna, Everidge um, type things. And she could just do it. And she spoke so beautifully. And it, it still makes me feel very emotional. And it's for her, it was um, a way of overcoming. So she obviously had that issue for whatever reason. Um, but it was a way of differentiating the classroom so actually she could take and actually accepting that sometimes she might not be able to but actually giving her the opportunity so whether it was through a digital device or through dressing up and the boy i mean the boys that didn't want to you know bottom, you know lower ability year eight bottom set you know fun the fun and games ones um and year nine they would absolutely love it and it was a case of you know i want my classroom to be for real learning to take place and real speaking really good quality speaking experiences um and in order to do it was to bring in fancy dress now fancy dress at secondary whether they're 11 12 13 14 15 16 you know even some in sixth form and i taught sixth form they've done it as well because it just helps them overcome their anxiety because it becomes a performance so you sort of bring in some of those drama techniques if you like so then that again helps with oracy projection etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah, and there are photos of you and colleagues in in full fancy dress gear standing in your classroom. I remember from one of your blogs. I remember seeing a few years ago. So, yeah, no, it's, it's uh, you walk, definitely walk in the talk, Claire. The in terms of the things that thank you, um, Kristen, Claire. In terms of the things that are in the classroom as opposed to uh, around the classroom, if you mm -hmm. like, what what sorts of things have you seen? Good good practice or anything in your book about the things in it, other than the tables and the chairs? 
Okay, so what I think it, uh, one of my favourite chapters is about sort of thinking of zones within the classroom, so different different sort of areas, and um, you know, we see don't we, in primary the very often the beautiful um, area that's created, the, the really nurturing, warm space where we go to enjoy books and reading and, and that corner that's for this and, and sort of sort of the different functions within one classroom. And one of the things that saddens me greatly is that as children get older, they, they, there's this disconnect from all that lovely practice that we see as they're younger. Classrooms become much more uniform, much more rigid. So trying for me, I think um, some of the best practices about trying to create these zones where um, they exist within, within this classroom. So a good example might be what I call the secret challenge zone um, I'm very mindful of children that might have um, learning you know special educational needs struggle in different ways so rather than they're always singled out and the TAs always sell a tape to that kid um, I might think well okay let's take um, a sealed envelope and it just says um, in secret invitation come and meet me in the secret challenge zone and it's stuck under that chair's child's chair before the lesson it's the work of a moment to do but that excited me when you say okay right something different's happening now I'm opening the secret challenge zone um, if you've been invited, your invite's under your chair. So you see even big kids, oh, I'm throwing up ones looking, oh yeah, teenagers, they've got their, their envelope. Um, and then they'll come. And so all you're doing is you're inviting them to come and sit in conference with you. But we have this space within the lesson where I'm, I'm going to differentiate. I'm going to do something for these kids uh, that's very bespoke to their needs. And every kid will get an opportunity on rotation, but we're just carving out that space within the, the whole classroom for this smaller in-class intervention. So it's not your guided reading that happens on a Tuesday morning as regular as clockwork for those kids. It's it's a much more responsive element it's a way of being able to reach out to those kids that that you need to engage with you know I worry about them what do they call them rather disparagingly the wallpaper kids the ones that never give you any they're there but they never give you any any grief they're not necessarily on your radar we can we can pull those children into the into the learning in a different sort of way so I think as I was listening to Krista I was reflecting that one of the things that strikes me is this business of the permission to be playful kids are under so much pressure to grow up so quickly and I see it with my own eight-year-old daughter and, and the, just it's a weird time to be a kid I think and that's before we get started on the current um, pandemic but this permission that in my classroom we're going to do some really serious learning I will challenge you because that's my duty but we're going to have a damn good time while we're doing it so um, something as important as success criteria for example they need ramping up in, in, in order to take state you know to be memorable for kids so whether you're in year three or whether you're in year um, 13 with me whenever I'm sharing learning success success criteria with you we're going to do them with voices and we'll do them with actions so if we're talking about connective we'll do connective we remember that, that we tap you know back it up in our muscle memory that's a connective or a conjunction it's, it links things together and we'll go through them and we'll do them in our uh, mickey mouse voice so it's, it's connective connective and the kids will copy and then we'll do our gruffalo voices connective and then we do slow-mo connective and and they'll roll their eyes and you can imagine the um the teenagers and the posturing but what they're really saying when they say oh miss that's dead lame that is is there please come have a bit more of this because it's this permission to be playful within learning purposeful pedagogy but we can we can bring the joy back doesn't in my opinion that they've moved so quickly from that wonderful early years experience certainly in the uk of what you get in reception and then sort of sitting behind desks and being taught to like a mini adult in some year one classrooms because this that such is the system and we can keep some of that joy of continuous provision but it's just about working with with what we've got uh, so yeah permission to be playful for you and for them i think is really really important yeah no that's I, I think that's that will be all the more important going forward now we'll, we'll come to the going forward bit you mentioned the, the, the ta is a what role is uh, for the ta beyond just putting a nice border up um, yeah. with regard to dynamically different classrooms and the, the learning environment an absolutely crucial one and I think one of the saddest things for me whenever I'm training with TAs is, is this willingness within that sector of the profession to want to do more and to be actively involved but what I hear time and again is well I don't want is it my place am I allowed to do that I don't really want to offend a teacher this sort of um, tiptoeing around people's sensitivities and I'm the first to say yeah it, embrace it suggest it to the teacher because in the very best classrooms often if I'm flitting in as a visitor I can't tell who's the TA and who's the teacher because there's this interchangeable fluidity of role you might have uh, a, in fact, I said to one lady, oh, you, you're doing a brilliant job of challenging this. Can you tell me about your lesson plan? She was working with a small group and she said, oh, I'm not the teacher. I'm, I'm, I'm just the TA. Um, and she was as teacher as much as anybody else is. So I think there is this sort of fluidity and responsiveness. I'm perhaps uh, with a teacher doing this small group work here, as I described with the secret challenge zone. Um, I would hope that my TA would be parachuting the rest of the classroom for me, sort of chiving and chasing around behaviour and, and pushing them to me if they need that support. But yeah, it, it needs to be a partnership. And, and I'd be really 
interested in, in doing some more work actually about how how TAs feel about you know it bothers me that they have that that lack of confidence when they do such a crucial job yeah actually. yeah I you say to me, oh, I'm only the TA no you're the one and only TA don't, don't yeah. lose that down if you, if you talk yourself down other people give permission for others to talk you talk you down yeah. as well um uh, we've got what we've got oh, wow so it's going quickly about just over a quarter of an hour left um one question that comes to mind, and it's more of a secondary thing than a primary thing, and it's also a bit of an FE thing, and I'll bounce this one to Krista. The teachers who say, I'd love to do all of that, but I don't have my own classroom. I'm the one who has to sort of move around. Are there, are there any sort of tips or techniques for anybody? And, and, I, and I go into the schools and colleges around the world that are like that, and they're some of the worst displays, or some of the oldest displays mm -hmm. are the ones in those classrooms where there isn't that sense of responsibility and belonging. What, any, any thoughts on that, Krista? Um, yeah, absolutely. And as, um, and as someone who's been in middle and senior leadership for a long time, you know, it's a case of, do you keep your nice, lovely classroom or do you give it to your new NQT? And, you know, the answer to that is you hand it over to your NQT because you're a good human and, um, you know, you give them the opportunity to create routines and, you know, what, it might, might be a bit tough for you, but you'll get your... Um, step count up so it'll be a good thing um, and you can live in a box and traveling teachers are absolutely fine around the school it's never ideal when you get um, you know 35 in a modern foreign languages classroom you know in in an IT suite or actually you know it's just not appropriate but you know what you make the best of what you've got and one thing that I found that I needed to do increasingly was to go to those classrooms beforehand and get, partly because the day was such that I was in five different classrooms that day so I'd put things on the exterior of the door um, with sort of um, coloured tape or police tape type stuff you can get it off various different sites on on the internet to just get um, students thinking when they're there so you've got them already thinking about that but once you're in the classroom it becomes your space because then you create that new Music. You, you know you're bringing that music you bring who you are and I think um, you may not be able to create the most wonderful displays and if you do create displays in this room you know sods law someone else is going to book to that room so you've got to go elsewhere so and you can't just spend 10 minutes rolling uh, rolling displays out to get up on the wall but you can take things with you um, in the box you, we can all find excuses for things but it's finding a way around it a creative solution around it so do what you do you know your students want to learn from you so bring your repertoire of things so it might be a handful of things sock puppets it might be music it might be magazines it might be something but make sure that you get it to that space beforehand it's not difficult we can make it difficult for ourselves but it just takes a bit of organization so maybe 20 minutes going into school earlier that morning instead of enjoying a coffee with your colleagues you have to walk around and just deliver the things that you need for later in that day but it can be done to make sure that those students have um have a purposeful um, learning experience and lesson with you where they do learn. It's not just a, oh, we're in this room, it's not really ours, so we can't really do very much. Mm. You know, learning yeah. is vital, learning is important, and every single lesson counts. We yeah. know that. Yeah. Claire, so any thoughts on that, the, the, the travelling teacher? Yeah, just a very, a very practical thing that travels ever so well is um, if you think about uh, big rolls of paper, so I, I'm thinking of sort of backing paper. Uh, sort of stuff you put behind wallpaper big big sheets that can be rolled up and we talk about those in the book as learning scrolls so maybe at the end of one lesson what we do is we have a couple of kids that might be writing the big learn you know the plenary the big messages go onto this this scroll and then we rather symbolically and, and we kind of overstate it that we're wrapping this up now it's going away but i'll be expecting you to remember what's on this learning scroll before i roll it out at the start of next lesson so that it's not just the carrying it around for carrying it around the sake we will be able to add to it and, and use it but when they see the scroll before i've opened my mouth what they should be thinking is hang on what what did we write on that last lesson johnny is that where you wrote down that the and and it should bring the learning back so i'm very interested in props that support memory um and aren't particularly cumbersome there's an idea again in the book about a, um, a message in a bottle and plastic bottle and recycling when the kid has the breakthrough moment they give me that perfect description of exactly what photosynthesis is or the, the wonderful sentence that they've constructed in french get them to write it down and we put that marker in into the into the bottle so that when I show them the bottle again and I say photosynthesis from memory can you all write down what that brilliant definition was so it, it kind of it's not the the it's not the prop for gimmick's sake it's the prop because it supports the memories the retrieval so I think this this classroom and you know I, I talk about a Mary Poppins bag a bag full of all these goodies so that as I pull out the green bottle they think photosynthesis they see the scroll they think and it should be connotating and suggesting things that that, that support their memory um so yeah I, I'm, I'm you know like I'm a travelling teacher myself, and that's how I describe myself. Like a lot of us do, we, we live out the boots of our cars. It's amazing what you can <laughs> what you can have with you at any moment. 
So the, the, yeah. in the million dollar question now, so we've identified in terms of good practice for creating a positive, focused learning environment and we smile and we welcome and we, it, there's a sense of intrigue and mystery and curiosity and energy that's created in the rooms or, uh, or uh, coming out of the bags. And now we're going to go into a world where, and I've already seen photos where this is taped off and that's taped off and you have to sit there and you're not allowed to move around there. What, what, if you were in charge of the learning spaces in the school, uh, how would you approach going back now, whenever that might be, whether that's next week or next, next month? Um, Claire, start with you. Um well, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to steal some. But Krista and I spoke yesterday about the about this session, and and there was something that Krista said that I thought was so powerful. So, with her permission, I'll share her thought first, which was, um, these children need to feel safe. They're stepping back into schools as early as next Monday, and some of them are going to be terrified. And that's not overstating it. And that's just the pupils. I think that the anxiety levels for teachers are through the roofs and for the parents. So, Krista's first principle yesterday, and I agree wholeheartedly, is they've got to feel loved and safe. And um, that manifesting that in every wall and every space you know even, i'm not talking about being up all night laminating posters but the more positive affirmations we can get that we are we're so thrilled to see you back isn't it great to be together we're okay here we are safe let's let's just remind them of all of that first and foremost because the the, the level of bravery that's going to be required for people next week and i don't think that's overstating it is going to be massive so once they're, once they're in and we've, we've, we've sort of done that in those early days, I think what's going to strike kids very much is all the things they can no longer do. And that sterility. As I look at these classrooms, it's lots of the joys disappeared, hasn't it? You can't have the soft toys anymore because you can't touch them. We can't wash them at 60 degrees. It, it, it's all these things have disappeared. So what can we have instead? And it seems to me that this is where these walls, these displays, they can really be amped up and sort of earn their keep. So something like, okay um there's some games in the classroom you can't go if you think about all the pedagogies that teachers won't be able to use it's really bothering me the things that we would reach for automatically the group work the high-fiving it's it's all gone for now so what we have instead is these classrooms and if we apply the principle of what we call gamification let's make it intriguing let's make it enticing if we do something like the 360 degree flip from the book so you're all facing this wall with me now and something's disappeared you've not seen this for three months or for however many weeks um can you remember that word that I've partially covered up? There's a P, and what was the P for? The P was for, can anybody remember? You're saying pyramid, you reckon it's pyramid? Right, okay, drum roll please, let's have a look. Yes, you've remembered pyramid. And um, let's pivot 90 degrees now, we're gonna look at this wall here. Can you remember what, something on the maths board? And I can sort of see how we could, we could still have minimum movement, the kids in their space, but they're just turning their eyes or their body. But we suddenly say to them, look, this is, this is your space. This is, this is the stuff that we know. It's the things that were, you know, don't change the displays that were up, but let's just use them to nudge memory and to see what survived over this period of lockdown. And anything that they're looking at blank will obviously become a trigger for a responsive teacher that's going to have to be revisited we're not going to assume we have to revisit everything we'll take our cue from the the students but it's 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 going to be about how we put the the, the nurturing messages back in a very overt way but also an opportunity to use the the skeletal classroom much more creatively and what you're describing is almost like a 360 degree process isn't it as opposed yeah. to the kids are there facing that way and the teachers are facing yeah. that way the, the children are there and the teachers safely has got a sort of a, a, a track going around yeah. so they're drawing on all the spaces that they can exactly so the kid the kid pivots on the spot but you do a full 360 of all the things that we've learned so far this year that are sitting in our physical environment let's just start there that's 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 a sensible place to start isn't it that's not worry about new learning let's just see if any of this has survived lockdown and how good those kids will feel when they remember that yeah that p was pyramid and the pyramids were the, the egyptians and and it will start to feel familiar again that was that was Chris's word yesterday how we get them to feel familiar in the physical space but also the familiarity with that learning yeah one of the came through from Lorraine Peterson we spoke to uh, who's a special needs specialist was the idea of you know taking photographs of the learning environment and sending them home this week or mm -hmm. in advance so that they they're walking into something where they've at least seen it before it's not totally alien from how from how it was and then something an idea that came out in another conversation yesterday was doing that but also asking for the parents and the children how would they like the environment so remotely getting them to be part of the design of that of that process and mm -hmm. there are things that are that, that, that they 
thought about or sent forward in advance maybe that, that are there up on the wall so there's a sense of that's yeah I was part of this not totally alien when they walk in Krista any thoughts on that that, that Claire hasn't stolen from you already <laughs> sorry Krista <laughs> no, no no we are ITL family you know we all you know we we share we are you know and we all have brilliant ideas um it's relationships first isn't it whenever I've done work with you know in my career I've had the privilege to work with NQTs and, and and trainees and one of the things is you know relationships first you've got to build that relationship um here in Bristol there's been news stories about families who've had one digital device and you know five or six children and then when when one of the parents who's a key worker goes to work that digital device has to go um and and you just think right okay it's not about oh you know you've missed all this time we have to crack on and I know there are some areas of the world who are always going to say that but you know what education is more than a process done to you it's about that relationship first if you have that power of human connection and these some of these children you know are grieving their friends and and grieving being in school and they and they're going to come back but only 50 percent of their mates are going to be there so you can't just crack on with the learning because there's only perhaps half a class and unless you're in a very specialist school like um one of the um spring world trust schools like um when i visited there there's you know um 12 15 15 groups of students up there in, unless you're in an environment like that you might have everybody you might not I don't know um, but in an in an ordinary mainstream classroom you might have you know your 30 kids but you haven't you know they they will be coming perhaps over a period of time so it's about that relation building those relationships first getting them to feel that it's okay and that actually this is familiar as Claire's just said but also we can't just crack on with learning let's just talk about let, let's just be present let's just see an experience let's know that we're here we're safe we're well you're okay I've really missed you and Jim said it so beautifully yesterday I mean the overwhelming um, feeling that teachers are going to have to just want to hug those children that they love and have cared for so much and have worried about for the last few months and probably been phoning or trying to phone um, you know to keep them connected is going to be phenomenal but making them feel that it's okay we're back acknowledging how they're feeling getting the students to discuss how they're feeling and then when they're comfortable when they're safe they trust that situation this new normal then learning can start then you can start recalling and retrieving things that they've learned as Claire said and I think if we start to run back with the learning and you must do this you must do that you've missed all this stuff oh we're running do you know what that will come afterwards relationships come first that power of human connection they haven't seen you for a while they probably really miss you they've probably got loads of stuff to say you know it's like six week four five six week school holidays you've got them where you are and then the summer hits and then they come back in September and the kids have forgotten seemingly everything and you've got a bit and you've got that's exactly the same thing that's so what we do if you were if you still had your class your French classroom and your children were going back in June whatever whenever it is ended up being what what would the environment what would you do to the environment as the, as they walk through the door for the first time coming back what would I do for the first time? I'd have a massive, great big sign in lots of different languages telling them how much I miss them and, and, and how happy I was to see them. I'd, I'd probably be dressed up in the fancy dress stuff just to make them smile, just to make them, sh just to show them that it's okay um, and that everything's, you know, quirkily normal and we're, we're all going to be fine together. That's what I do and get them talking about how they're feeling, you know, um, and get them saying that actually that that's okay because we don't know what a lot of these kids have experienced you know you've got a discussion later today about you know some big things that are reality for some of our young people we've got we've got thank you we've got four minutes what going forward what changes and we remember we're thinking in terms of classroom environments mm -hmm. what and think about technology as well and how technology has suddenly become a huge part of an even bigger part of the world of education and that includes not having access to technology mm -hmm. what what is the impact going forward, do you think, of, of environment technology? How will, how will we have learned to move forward? And I also include uh, maybe being outside and learning. That's, that's a lot to think about. Claire, go on. <laughs> um, yeah, that is an awful lot to think about. I think it, 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 it links to what we've just been discussing, really. If that return to school is about not just all the things that are different in the deficit model, but if it's about a celebration of the things that we can do, we do listen to the bird song now more. We we have more conversations at home. Please, God, that's a positive that might have happened for lots of people. Um, you're brilliant at technology. I mean, the things that this kid can do on her iPad now they blow my mind. So maybe it's about framing it as an opportunity to celebrate the, the, the learning, genuinely celebrate the things that have gone on. Um, 
schools closed, learning didn't stop. And let's let's get excited about that telling telling that story. And maybe that'll be a lovely way to ease children back into these environments. Tell me something that you can do now. What do, what are you proud of? What have you learned? Um, you you think you know something about the wormeries? Well, should we go outside and have a look at that? Because we, if you know we've got some outdoor space. So, um, being more flexible for teachers. I think you know I'm, I'm doing a lot of reading. As lots of people are about you know reflecting on what do we want as uh, individuals as people what do i want to, to cling on to do i want to go back to sitting in traffic jams every five minutes and the highly stressful commuting i did before not necessarily because i've really valued the, the quiet so uh, and, and, and a different pace of life so how we how we cling on to the things that were good about this period so trying to to, to empower teachers to to reflect on that what do you what do you want to keep what it, it wasn't all perfect before let's not just go back and, and do exactly the same what could we change that would be for the better? Um, so, yeah, I think so for me. Okay. Uh, Krista, then last, we've got two minutes. Well, you can have a minute of that. Okay, yeah. I think I think the perception that actually, um, certainly in secondary and certainly in modern foreign languages, that if you're outside, um, then you're not really learning. If you're out in the school field, it's just because your classroom's a bit hot and sweaty, as mine was about a million degrees, um, and one of the schools was like a greenhouse. Um, do you know what? Outdoor learning is an amazing thing. So getting students out and experiencing education from, you know, behind, well, n not from just behind their desk outside, because they can still do things outside. And actually, it's, uh, it's about using that in a new space. They can distance better. And actually, you could, in theory, have more students there if you were outside, weather depending. Um, it's, it's just about thinking differently. And then it's just getting students to show you what they know in new settings. And yeah. they'll be able to do that and share that really well. Wow, that hour went quick again. Uh, I, I thought I talked quickly, but you two talked very quickly. I think there were more words fitted into that hour than any other <laughs> webinar on the, the worst count of time. I hope that's been useful, everybody. Claire and Crystal, thank you so much. So many practical and useful and creative and doable ideas and perspectives to share. So thank you very much. Um, remember, put some money in the buckets of either NHS Relief Project, Winston's Wish, Big Issue or RSPV. If you want to carry on the conversation, at ITL Worldwide is, is the independent thinking um, Twitter handle, uh, independentthinking.com. You can make contact, find out a little bit more about Claire and Krista. Drop me an email in at independentthinking.co.uk if you want to ask me anything directly or, or for me to field any questions. Independentthinkingpress.com. Um, so Krista's um, independent thing on MFL book is available there and uh, Claire's assessment earlier assessment book but also dynamically different classrooms at the moment if you put the code CPD30 at checkout in the independent thinking press.com website you get 30% off those books the physical books if you want an ebook uh, you can get 50% off if you use the code VAT50 the government knocked back off ebooks just recently so we're sort of spreading the spreading the joy with that but you have to go to independentthinkingpress.com if you go to Amazon it costs you more and uh, less taxes paid and we need it for the NHS so thank you very much stay safe I look forward to seeing you in the flesh as soon as we possibly can thank you very much bye